I'd like to thank Pastor Philpott for his children's story to us today. And of course, Pastor Philpott is no stranger to us in Bilston. He had been to us before. And uh, for those of us who do not know him, I've not seen him before, Pastor Philpott works in the Stork districts. And uh, he is also the area coordinator at this time for area six, which is our area. Mm. And Pastor Philpock, we're very happy to have you in Bilston with us today. And uh, we pray that as you minister to us, that it will be a blessing to each and every one of us. But before Pastor Philpock speak to us, we've got a song um, for meditation, wonderful, merciful Savior. Amen. What a beautiful song, folks. Wasn't that beautiful? Absolutely. Well, good morning again, everybody. Well, oh, actually, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's good to be with you all. Thank you so much, um, Elder Griffiths, for the invite to be back with Wilson Church today. I was looking at um, my diary yesterday, actually. It was last, no, not last year, the year before November, I think, when I came to preach. And I had to cancel a date last year, so I do apologise. Things were really, really busy last year. Well, but, but as busy now, anyway. Mm. So thank you, Elder Griffiths, for the invite, and it's wonderful to be with you folks. Um, now you've been enjoying the lockdown and being on Zoom all the time. I'm, I'm sort of Zoomed out most of the time through the week because we have all of our conference meetings and pastors' meetings all on Zoom, and I do Bible studies and different things on Zoom. So it's Zoom, Zoom, Zoom through the week. So I'm looking forward to um, getting back to church. I know that some of you guys are as well. I know that some folks are pushing the conference to say, look, we need to open our church. We want to get back to church. And we do, don't we? We want to get back to church where we can worship God and, and just have that physicalness to be together. I mean, the, this is, we praise the Lord for technology, don't we? But you can't beat being in church physically and just seeing each other face to face and all those and the hugging, hugging and everything else that we, that we normally do in church as Adventists. But we have to be patient, folks, because uh, we're in we're in a, a situation at the moment that's going to continue for a for a good while yet. So yes, be patient. Uh, but one day soon we're going to be back into church. It may take a, a few more months to get back to some sort of normality, but it will happen, I'm sure, one day soon. Um, do you believe Jesus is coming soon? Yeah. Amen. He's coming back soon. The prophecy is everything's being fulfilled right in our own very generation. That's exciting. I know I'm excited. Are you are, are you enjoying um, the new lesson study, by the way? It started today, didn't it? I'm really excited because that's what I'm, that I, I'm into. Evangel I love evangelism. So I'm really excited about the next few weeks. I'm hoping that this lesson is going to reinvigorate us and... Um, really stir us for evangelism because after three months of studying this lesson we may be back at church and we may be able to go knocking on doors and evangelizing back into the town so hopefully this lesson will prepare us for what's to come our lesson to uh, our lesson our message today is called um slapped in the face slapped in the face so let's have a prayer together father in heaven we're thankful for the gift of the Sabbath, and we're thankful that we can be here today to worship you uh, through this communication. Lord, you always provide for us, and we thank you that we have Zoom and other platforms where we can still be together. Lord, help us to be patient in the weeks and the months ahead that one day soon we will be back at church and we will be worshiping together. But Lord, for now, we need to be patient and look for other ways to evangelize for you. So, Lord, I pray now that you will bless our time together as we open the scriptures and as we share this short message. May your Holy Spirit speak to each one of us, a message that will stir us and prepare us for the soon com coming kingdom. It is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Many years ago, I had a friend uh, and she lost a job. She was sacked from her job. And there was probably no way at all that she could go to a tribunal and get the job back. And she was in dire straits. And she needed, she needed somebody to give a testimony that would help vindicate her character. And she came to me and my wife. We were best friends with this particular person. 
and she asked us if we would be witnesses in her tribunal case and we agreed to it and so the months went on and then eventually they gave her a date and so we went to court and we were there to try and help exonerate her we were there to help vindicate her character before these people that were in the court there was about six people that, that sat before us and the education department were there to speak against her and so they gave their side of the thing of, of, of what had happened and why they had sacked her and then they called in myself and my wife to give our side of things and to give a character witness for our friend and from all the information that was given there was no way really that she was going to get a job back and it was looking a little bit dire really and so my wife went first and then i spoke now at the time i was a, i was a serving prison officer and we were all my wife and i were also foster carers so and and, and i had a, a a position in church as well i was one of the leaders in the church so to the to the um the people that were there sat listening to all this information we sort of had some authority they must have thought oh he's a prison officer they're foster children the leaders in the church oh they're not just anybody from the streets you know they have a little bit of authority in life and so we gave our side of the things of, of what had happened and what we thought of our friend so we gave all this information obviously we, we were we we had you know we had to swear on the bible and so we had to give the truth and nothing but the truth and so they deliberated for a few hours and they came back in afterwards and they found in favor for our friend and what tipped it in her what tipped it for her was the things that me and my wife said about our friend and sometimes when you ask your best friends to come and speak on your behalf, obviously the court are thinking, well, they're going to say these things because it's the best friends. You're going to try and get your best friends off with this particular allegation. But we spoke the truth. We spoke the truth. And I think that came through to the panel. And so they exonerated her and they gave her a job back and they gave her a lot of money in, in the process as well. And so we were there to vindicate the character of our friend. And it worked. Our message today is about God is on trial. Did you know God is on trial? And he's waiting for somebody to vindicate his character to the rest of the universe. <clears throat> In the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 14. Just to give you a little bit of background behind the exoneration or the vindication of God's character. Why does God need vindicating at this time? God is God. He knows everything. He's all powerful. He's all known. He's everywhere. Why does, why does God's character need vindicating to the rest of the universe? In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 14, Isaiah says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You see, Lucifer had an eye problem. Did you see that? Did you get that? I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Lucifer had an eye and still does. He has an eye problem. 30 years ago, I had an eye problem. I rubbed my eye the one day and my eye just filled with this gooey gel. And 30 years on, I still have the eye problem. And I've been to many doctors, many different practitioners and tried all sorts of medication and all sorts of different remedies and I still have an eye problem. I'll rub my eyes. Sometimes I'll feel as though there's a little bit of dust in there. And I'll start to rub it. And all of a sudden my eyes are just filled with this gooey gel. And it takes about an hour for it to die, to, 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 to reduce before I can see again. 30 years on, I still have the same eye problem. Nobody can cure me. 
and I've tried all diets, tried everything. I still have an eye problem. Satan had an eye problem and still has an eye problem. And it's all about me, 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 me. And as we read, he said, I will, I will do this and I will do that and I will do this. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 2 and 15. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 2 and 15. It says, because your heart is lifted up, this is talking about Satan, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. You see, being the highest angel, Satan was created as the highest angel, the greatest angel, angelic being in the whole of the universe. It just wasn't enough for him. He wanted to be more than what he was. And he says, I'm going to be like the most high. So being the highest angel wasn't enough. And he wanted to be something else that he wasn't. Have you ever had that experience that you wanted to be more than what you are or what you were? And then sometimes we have the spirit of Satan and we want to ascend higher than what we should be. And we may trample on people as we go up the ladder. Satan wanted to establish his own government in heaven. You may have heard over the years, there's been many that they call them coup d'etats. It's where a dissatisfied or a disgruntled group of people within a particular country, they want to take over the government. And so by force, they become the new leaders in the government. They call it a coup d'etat. And so Satan wanted to create his own coup d'etat within the heavenly government. And how can Satan, the creative being, become like or take over the creator it's impossible but he was so dissatisfied disgruntled with his position that he wanted to create a crude a coup d'etat and so in revelation in revelation chapter 12 verse 7 through to 9 revelation chapter 12 verses 7 through to 9 he tells us some war broke out in heaven michael and his angels that's that's christ Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. In verse 4 of the same chapter, it says, His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And so Satan was was cast out of heaven there was a war in heaven the bible says you don't exactly know how that war went on but we know it was partly a war of words it's interesting that in verse four it says that his tail drew a third of the stars talking about satan the dragon you know when you think of a dragon you have this this you conjure up this picture of of, of, of this great big creature with, with big teeth and big eyes and big fat feet and he's roaming the earth and he has this big tail swirling about and the Bible says his tail drew a third of the stars, which are angels. I was brought up the youngest of six children. And our household was very, very busy with six children and, and two parents. And we were always arguing and fighting as, as children. And I was the youngest one and I took the brunt of the worst from my brothers and sisters. And we were all telling, always telling lies about each other. And going to my father and saying, dad, 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 so-and-so said this, dad, dad, so-and-so, just to get them into trouble. So my father would punish them. And my father would come to us and say, have you been telling tales again? You've been telling tales. Tell the truth. And so Satan was spewing his tales in heaven amongst the stars or amongst the, the heavenly angelic beings. He's telling them lies about God. He's spewing his tales. He's telling his lies. He's telling his tales. And he was so convincing that a third of the angelic beings, and you're talking about thousands and billions of angels, that they actually believed him. And these angelic beings were created by God. They were in the presence of God. They saw God. They saw Christ. They saw the power of God. They saw the love of God. And yet this Lucifer, was so convincing that a third of them were cast out of heaven. And so the Bible says that there was a war in heaven. 
and Satan and his angels were cast out. And so Satan was defeated, but he wasn't destroyed. But by his act of rebellion, he had declared God's government at fault. And by setting up his own throne, he's now making claims to a greater wisdom authority. So he wants to be the, 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 the God of the universe. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. And so he's claiming to a, to a greater wisdom than God the Father. Ellen White wrote, Ellen White wrote in uh, Selected Messages, book three, she says, the world's redeemer passed over the ground where Adam fell because of his disobeying the express Lord of Jehovah. And the only begotten son of God came to our world as a man to reveal to the world that men could keep the law of God. The Christ came to the world to reveal to the world that men could keep the law of God. Satan, the fallen angel, had declared that no man could keep the law of God after the disobedience of Adam. He claimed the whole race under his control. So this was like a whoosh. This is the slap in the face for God. Satan is claiming that human beings can't keep the law of God. And so you can imagine the rest of the, the heavenly host. We know that there's other worlds out there with other unfallen beings on them. And we know there's billions of angels. And Satan's making this claim to God. Nobody can keep your law. And this is like the whoosh. The slap in the face for God. Because the rest of the universe must have been thinking, wow, did you hear that claim from Satan? Nobody can keep the law. Can you imagine me standing on your pulpit back in Bilston Church now? And I make a particular claim. And Elder Griffiths walks up to me. Whoosh, and he slashes me, slaps me across the face. And you all sit there going, <gasps> did you see what Elder Griffiths has just done? He's just slapped Pastor Ian in the face. And you're all sat there thinking, why is he done that? And what is Pastor Ian going to do next? And you're all waiting for my response. Is Pastor Ian going to slap him back? I may have told you when, when, I, when I came to you the first time that I used to be a martial arts instructor. I used to teach karate. I was very, very good. And you're waiting for Pastor Ian to do this, whoosh, to do this, this karate punch or this karate kick, how is he going to respond to Elder Griffiths? What's his reaction going to be? When Satan made that claim, when he said that nobody could keep the law of God, the rest of the universe are like, <gasps> what's God going to do now? What is God going to do now? It was that slap in the face for God and the rest of the universe are waiting for God's response. Could anyone really be able to achieve what Satan said was impossible? Is it really possible to keep the law of God? To remove every doubt in the minds of the angels and later man and the rest of the universe, God must let Satan go on with his work. We talk about the great controversy. We read the book, The Great Controversy. What a wonderful book, by the way. We need to keep witnessing and keep giving that book out. We're caught up in the middle of this great controversy between good and evil, between Satan and Christ. But God, to remove the doubts in the minds of everybody within the universe, has had to allow Satan to go on with his work, to prove that Satan is evil and that all evil comes from Satan, but God has, has, a, has allowed him to do it for the last few thousand years. Many people ask the question, don't they? Why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? If God's a loving God, why hasn't he just destroyed Satan? It's a great question. It's one I've been asked many, many times. God has, a, has allowed Satan to reveal himself, to reveal his character before the rest of the universe. When Satan made these claims in heaven, before he was cast out, and then when he came to earth, tempted Adam and Eve, caused them to sin, 
and said that no man could keep the law of God. Satan, God, the, the universe, has been waiting in waiting for the response of God. Yes, the universe have seen the love of God. But until Jesus actually went to the cross and died on the cross, they didn't really see the fulfillment of the love of God. It was only when Christ went to the cross, as he promised he would, the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Remember at the beginning, um, when, when, when sin came in, there was a savior. Christ was going to be the savior of mankind. And so when he went to the cross and he hung on the cross and he died for mankind, the rest of the universe were like, oh, he is a loving God and Satan is evil. And so Jesus had to go to the cross and he had to die on the cross for each one of us to prove his love and to prove that Satan was evil, unjust, unfair, unloving. And so God has allowed Satan to demonstrate his real character. And we're just caught up in the middle of this great battle between good and evil. And so when, so Jesus became man to demonstrate to the universe that it was and is possible to keep the law of God. Psalm 40 verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O my God. This is a prophecy of Christ, by the way. And your law is within my heart. We know that Jesus came as a human being and he kept the law perfect in all of its ways. Ellen White says in Selected Messages, Volume 3, Christ's human nature was created and it did not even possess the angelic powers. It was human. She says his human nature was, his nature was human, identical with our own. And we know we have a fallen human nature. Jesus also had that human, fall, that human fallen nature. But not once did he sin. Not once did he give in to fallen passions and feelings. Satan knew that when Christ died without having been able to make him sin, his own doom was sealed. He knew that when Christ died on that cross, he knew his doom was sealed and he was going to end up in, he's going to end up in the lake of fire. He knows that now. But now his conflict is with you and I. He knows that he can cause distress, unhappiness with the Father, the Son and the Spirit by destroying you and me. And that's why Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 tells us, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnants of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So Satan is wroth with me and you. It's the remnant church. It's the church that has the truth. It has the Bible truth. It's preaching this truth. And Satan is wroth with me and you because we have the truth. He's not so much concerned with the rest of the world or with Babylon because he has them in his pockets anyway. He's, he's mad with me and you because we have the truth. And he knows that we've been called to preach and teach the truth. So his beef is with me and you. But you know, God, God has reserved his greatest demonstration of his power for the last generation, the last generation. And this generation, which is you and I, bears the results of accumulated sins and hereditary weaknesses. How many of us have hereditary weaknesses? We're 6,000 years on. We know that Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. They, 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 they rebelled against God and, and they committed the sin. But they didn't die for another 900 odd years. And Ellen White talked about how their, their brains were powerful. They didn't, need, they didn't need to write things down. Everything was just memorized. They had powerful minds and bodies. But 6,000 years on, you and I <laughs> are suffering. The accumulated sins and hereditary weaknesses. My wife suffers with certain um, genetic disorders and it's been passed down to my daughter and my daughter suffers. She's disabled. She lives in a bedroom and she's quite disabled now. Well, part of a problem is that she suffers hereditary weaknesses, genetic disorders. They have, uh, it's called um, a genetic um, gene mutations of MTHFR and CPL 
and HL, HCL, the, the genes that help us detox in our bodies. And my wife's gene and my daughter's genes don't work. There's hereditary problems there. And you can't just turn a switch or take a pill and they'll switch back on again. They're just gone. And so they suffer the consequences of hereditary weaknesses. Adam and Eve were given a simple test and they failed that test. In the last days, God's last generation of people will also be given a test. But it will be a test that's more severe than what Adam and Eve went through. Adam and Eve were just told not to eat from that fruit there, from that tree. Don't touch that fruit. That's the only test that we're given. The test that you and I are going to go through is going to be more severe because we're, God's going to use you and I, by the way, to vindicate his character. Because the claim is from Satan to the rest of the universe that this God is unjust, is unfair, is unloving, is unkind. And God's going to use you and I to vindicate his character. There's many examples in the Bible, but the one great example, we all know the story of Job, don't we? Job went through his suffering. He didn't know what, what Satan had said to God. We do because we have the scriptures. But Job went through a personal time of tribulation and struggles and trials. But not once did he, not once did he sin against God. He asked questions. He questioned God. That's okay. But he didn't sin against God. Satan's accusation was, yes, God, he only loves you because of everything that you give him. You take it all away from him, he'll curse you to your face. God says, okay, Satan, do what you've got to do. Do what you've got to do. So God used Job to vindicate his character because the accusation was from Satan to God, yes, God, he only loves you because of everything that you give him and everything that you do for him. But you take it away from him, you see, he'll curse you to your face. And that was the accusation. And then the rest of the universe are thinking, oh, what's going to happen now? And God said to Satan, have you seen Job? Watch. And God used Job to vindicate his character to the rest of the universe. The beautiful thing is, folks, that God has a remnant church in the last days that will vindicate God's character to the rest of the universe. It hasn't been fully revealed yet. Revelation chapter, well, the book of Revelation chapter 7 and 14 talks about the 144,000. That is the group of people in the last days that will vindicate God's character. And that group will be there once the door of probation closes. And this will be the final contest between good and evil. You see, God has to show that his people are worshipping and serving him through love and obedience and that nothing they do is for themselves but have selflessly given their lives to him because of what Jesus did for them on the cross. So God is going to prove to the rest of the universe that he has a group of people that love him because of what Jesus did for him on the cross. The, their only motivation, the only motivation they have is to please God. And the threat of torture and persecution has no hold on them whatsoever, and they would rather die than sin. So the threats of persecution to God's people were like, okay, do what you got to do. Just like the martyrs of old, as you read about in the great controversy, right through the Reformation, when all these people were put on the stake and they were burnt and they were through and, 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 and destroyed and died in terrible ways. When they were told to give up the Bible, they were, okay, do what you got to do. We're not going to give up my faith in Christ. God will have this group of people in the very last days. God will show to the universe that his law can be kept under the most discouraging circumstances that man has ever faced. But here's the last thing, folks. Here's the last thing. To make the demonstration complete, the demonstration of God's real people, God does one more thing. He hides himself. He hides himself. You remember Jesus was on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where was God the Father? He was there, but he had to hide himself. But he was there. But Jesus cried out, where are you, Father? 
the sanctuary in heaven will be closed. Jesus, our intercessor, is no longer interceding on our behalf and has left heaven. Our scripture reading, that beautiful verse in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time, remember this is the close of probation now. Probation closes. There's no more opportunities for anybody to repent, to give their lives to Christ. It's all finished. And at that time, shall Michael stand up. The great, the judgment is over, by the way. The judgment that you read about in Daniel chapter 7, reading the book, the books were opened, it's finished. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. I hope you're reading this verse. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be destroyed. No, it doesn't say destroyed, does it? It says, and at that time thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. This is where God will demonstrate through these people that he is a just and a loving and a fair and honest God. And that human beings can keep the law of God. Because Jesus has left the sanctuary he is no longer interceding on behalf of you and I. So we have nowhere else to go. But now we've reached a level now where it's okay that Jesus isn't there interceding. He's left heaven and he's coming back to earth to deliver his people. And God's people will go through that time of trouble, such as never was. And they will keep the law of God perfectly. Yes, they'll be crying out day and night for deliverance, but they won't be sinning. And God will demonstrate to the rest of the universe that he has a group of people who sincerely love him. Not because of everything that they've had or have, but because they love God and what Jesus did on the cross. And they want to please God. And they don't want to sin. And they're desperate to be saved for the kingdom. And God will vindicate his character to the rest of the universe. And he'll say, universe, can you see this group of people? Watch them. There are 144,000 jobs. Is the, is the number literal or symbolic? Well, you choose. Either way, God will have a group of people that will vindicate his character. But you know, to vindicate God's character, we don't have to wait until then. Enoch walked with God and God translates him to heaven without seeing death. Ellen White says that in our day now, there are Enoch's. In other words, there are people that walk with God. And when you do a study on what, what does it mean to walk with God? It means to keep his commandments. And we know that God's last day people will be keeping the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. We can be vindicating God's character now by keeping the law of God. But we can't do it in our own righteousness can we Isaiah says in uh, 64 verse 6 that our righteousnesses are like filthy rags so when we're doing these good deeds when we think that we're doing all these good favors for our church folk and for our families and for our neighbors and doing the community things that we do when we do it in our own strength Isaiah says they're like filthy rags dirtiness filthiness the apostle Paul says it's not I that live the Christ that lives in me. When Christ lives on in, in us, then the good works that we do are not they're no more like filthy rags. Because it's Christ that's doing the good deeds through us. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that is encouraging us and guiding us to do the good things that we do. That's the kind of life that we need to be living. And I that live. Christ that liveth in me through the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the gospel is this, folks. When I first became a Christian 20 years ago, I didn't fully understand the gospel. And I didn't realize at the time when I first came into the church 20 years ago that I could live a righteous life and that I could come overcome all of the sins in my life. 
But I've learned over the years that as I give my life to Christ, that he is the one that gives me the power to overcome these sins in my life. And that, yes, I can live a righteous life. And now when I witness to people, it took me a few years to learn this, that when I'm out on the streets and I'm talking to the winos and the down and outs, when I was a prison officer working in the prisons and, and, and working with these destitute prison prisoners who have nowhere else to go, they're at the lowest ebb. When I speak to them now, I can tell them about a God that loves them deeply and that he will give them the power to overcome sin in their life. And that is the power of the gospel, folks. The power of the gospel is that we can overcome sin. We can be overcomers. That we can stop sinning through the power of God. That the Holy Spirit comes into us and gives us that power to overcome. Surely you must have had one sin in your life that God has given you the power over. If he's giving you the power over at least one sin, do you think he can give you power over two, three, four, five more? Of course he can. That is the power of the gospel. And that's the message that we really need to understand for ourselves, that we can overcome sin through the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. And we can take that message to others out there who are struggling with sin. Your family members who haven't converted yet, your neighbours, your work colleagues, your friends at school, college, university, you now have a message. When you understand it yourself and accept it for yourself, you have a message to take to these people and tell them that they can overcome sin, that there's something better for them. You see, the false gospel is that, yes, accept Christ as Lord and Saviour, yes, get baptised, yes, join the church, yes, knock on doors. But Satan's false gospel is, You'll always sin. You're always going to sin, but it's okay. It's okay. Jesus will still, stay, will still save you. That is the false gospel, folks. If we're still sinning, we ain't going to heaven because sin won't be accepted into heaven. So we have to let go of sin if we want to go to heaven. But folks, the power of the gospel is you and I can overcome sin through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I know that some of you out there right now who are listening or watching, you're struggling with sin in your life. And God is desperate to give you the victory over whatever that sin is or sins. He's desperate to give you the, the victory because he wants to give you peace in your life. He wants to give you that peace that passeth all understanding. And he's desperate to use you to vindicate his character because the accusation is that nobody can keep the law. And God wants to use you and I to vindicate his character to the rest of the universe because God is on trial. Will you and I be part of that group that will vindicate the character of God through the way in which we live our lives? Maybe there's somebody that's watching and listening to this right now and you are struggling with sin in your life. And today... You want to make a decision to say, Lord, I have this sin or sins. And they're keep keeping me captive. I'm still a slave to sin. And Lord, I want to be set free because I want to serve you. I want to serve you, Lord. I don't want sin in my life. I want to serve you 100%. You can make that decision today. In a moment, I'm going to, I'm going to pray. But if there's somebody that's listening right now watching this, I'm just going to invite you, just wherever you are, just to raise your hand and say, Lord, please give me the victory over this particular sin or sins. And I want to experience that peace that passeth all understanding. And I want to understand, I want to understand this gospel message so that I can go out to other people and share with them and prove to them it can be done because Jesus has done it in me. If that's you out there, folks, just raise your hand and say, Lord, please give me the victory. Please, Lord, give me the victory. And use me, Father. Use me to vindicate your character to the universe. Vindicate your character, Lord, by using me. And say, look, look at Pastor Ian. Look what he's doing. Look at Elder Griffiths. Look at Elder Clarence. Look, see, they're vindicating my character. 
look at the wonderful life they're living. And it's not because of what I'm doing. It's not because of all the things I've given them. It's because they've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And they want to serve me through love because of his sacrifice. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the cross. The cross has to be at the heart of our Christian experience. Without, without seeing Jesus on the cross and understanding why Jesus died on the cross and, and seeing, seeing him hang there and why he died for us, Lord, that should be the, the, the heart of our Christian experience. And when we come to an understanding of it, when we realize that Jesus died for me because I'm a sinner and he exchanged places with me and now he gives me the hope of eternal life, that I don't have to die that second death, then our love for you grows deeper and deeper and deeper. Lord, the accusation is that, that mankind can't keep your law, but Jesus came as a human being. And he proved it can be done in human nature. And now Jesus says to us, you also can keep the law. If you accept my Holy Spirit into your lives and accept the power that I'm going to give you to overcome each day. Each day is a battle. And we know the Apostle Paul says that I die daily. We need to die daily too, to our selfishness. Greatest battle we will, we will fight is self. And so, Father, I'm asking in a special way, there's people who've raised their hands out there and people that didn't, who are still struggling with sin. And I'm asking, Lord, in a special way that you will give each one of us that victory over sin so that we may experience your peace that passeth all understanding. And that, Lord, we will prove to the universe that your law can be kept through the power of your Holy Spirit working in each one of us. So, Lord, pour out your spirit in each one of us right now and give us the victory that we need so that you may save us for your soon coming kingdom. Lord, thank you for this church in Bilston. Thank you for their presence. We know that one day soon the churches will be reopened. And as we continue through these weeks and months going through this beautiful lesson, Lord, of making friends for God, I pray, Lord, that you will inspire us and, and encourage us and, 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 Lord, give us that fire in our bellies that when it's possible, we can go out there, Lord, and preach this message that you've given to us, this message of the three angels' messages. That's why you have raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church, is to teach and preach the three angels' messages to a dying world. And may you use Bilston in a special way, that new people will join the church because of their love, one for another. It's my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'd like to thank Pastor Philpott for his message to us today. We really appreciate his agreeing to come to us, and we are not disappointed. Amen. So we thank you very much for blessing us, and we know we will see you again. Amen. So, right, I know we'll put you on again. <laughs>